So good evening, everyone. Um, I hope those of you who came early enjoyed our little experiment in whether you can actually do social interaction on Zoom. Um, I'm Julie Rowine. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Concord Carlisle, and I'd like to welcome you all to our winter event with speaker Juliet Kayam. It's wonderful to see our local members, if only online, and also those of you who are joining us from beyond Concord and Carlisle. Thank you for coming. Yes, in more usual times, our winter program is a breakfast held at Concord's Colonial Inn. This year, of course, we cannot gather in person, and we know that in our community, as in many others, food security has increased terribly during this pandemic. The LWVCC board has chosen this year to take the funds we usually use to support breakfast for ourselves and donate them to our local food pantry, Open Table. We invite you to join us in this effort by donating to Open Table or to your local food pantry. And I will put a link to Open Table in the chat for you to use if you're so inclined. Before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I'd like to give you an idea of how the structure of the event will go. After Ms. Kayam's prepared remarks, I will moderate a question and answer period with her for about 15 to 20 minutes. In order to include as many questions in, as possible, we ask that you put your questions into the chat. You can do this at any point during the program. We have a pair of Concord Carlisle League members who will be keeping track of questions for us once we reach the Q&A section. As this is a largish group relative to what our league usually handles, we would like to ask everyone to keep their mutes on for the duration of the program. And I will note that the program is being recorded. Since our founding in 1920, the League of Women Voters has worked to foster civic engagement and to enhance access to voting. The League is a nonpartisan organization and does not support or oppose any candidate or political party. We do advocate on issues, and today we have seen the passage of the Comprehensive Climate Bill, one of the legislative goals of our state league. Congratulations to Senator Mike Barrett, who I believe has joined us this evening, and all the legislators whose work has made this possible. We also strive to present timely educational events related to the issues of the day. And it is hard for me to imagine a speaker more relevant to our current situation than our speaker this evening, Juliet Kayyem. Juliet Kayyem has served as a national leader in the Homeland Security efforts of the United States. You may be familiar with her commentaries in the Boston Globe or her essays in the Atlantic Monthly. She also appears as a national security analyst on CNN and as a weekly guest on Boston Public Radio. She served as the first undersecretary for Homeland Security in Massachusetts and as assistant secretary for intergovernmental affairs in the Federal Department of Homeland Security during the Obama administration. She has spent over 15 years managing complex policy initiatives and organizing government responses to major crises in both state and federal government. Ms. Kayyem is currently the Robert and Renee Belfer Senior Lecturer in Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she's Faculty Director of Home the Homeland Security Project and also the Security and Global Health Project. She's also the CEO of Grip Mobility, a company which is working on transparency in the rideshare industry. And now I would like to turn this over to our speaker, Juliet Kayyem. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Julie. Oh, there we go. Am I good? Thumbs up, Julie. You got me? Um, it is so great to be back. I We were just talking about the last time I was at the League of Women Voters. Some of you remember I ran in the Democratic primary uh, God, many years ago. It was great fun. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I think right after I did an event uh, for the Wellesley uh, League of Women Voters, and that was terrific. Uh, but that's many years ago. And then for some of us, a lifetime ago, we've aged a lot. Uh, so um, I, when I was asked to come speak, I think uh, Julie or someone had seen me speak at another event. And and, and, and uh, you know, we've, do, we've done so much election and impeachment and everything. I actually would love to talk about substance, just to maybe ground you in sort of 
where we are right now as a nation um, with two of the major, oops, I just, oh, that's so interesting. Is that me? Does it, here we go, you got that. Two of the, of the major um, uh, Homeland Security issues that we're confronting simultaneously and how uh, uh, the new administration will address them and what was happening in the previous administration. How are you with those slides? So I'll just talk for a second. I am not going to be discussing climate change, which I actually view as the greatest, greatest existential threat, um, um, or cyber attacks, which are also, of course, at the forefront, only because I just time is limited and I wanted to focus on COVID and, of course, extremism. Um, uh, but happy to answer those questions, because when I think about the sort of major issues in homeland security that we will be confronting for the next four years under this administration, they are radicalism and what happens to the hate, right, and what we saw on June 6th, um, and, and, and as a corollary, what happens to the political discourse about the hate, um, uh, COVID and the, and the vaccination efforts, uh, um, uh, climate change and how we live and how we mitigate, but also how we respond. And then fourth, of, of course, cyber attacks. So those are the four that people like me think about outside of the state-sponsored threats like China or, or, or Iran. Um, so I thought uh, I would sort of help us learn to live and manage amidst challenging times looking at 2021 um, and beyond. So let me start with COVID because uh, I wanted to uh, begin, and I guess everything begins and ends there, right? So next slide. Okay, so I do teach at the Kennedy School. I'm on the faculty there. And last March, or last January in 2020, I am, at the end of January, I'm teaching my crisis management course. It's called Mitigating and Managing a Crisis. Uh, in early January, because I those of you, if any of you are on Twitter or do social media, my my big platform is is Twitter. I I I, I try to educate my followers through Twitter, or put things in context, or post things that are interesting. January second, I posted an article, I think with just a question mark. Wall Street Journal, no, I'm sorry, Stat News, uh, a Boston Globe. Um, division. If you don't follow STAT News, it's just only online. They have the best reporting on COVID, I think. Stat News posts a story that was something like, there's this weird virus in China. China seems very nervous about it. They've called in the WHO more later, right? I mean, but it was so weird because, you know, the WHO doesn't get called in for every virus and things like that. So, so we, um, so people like me were following this, right? And, and what was happening. And then, um, so I'm teaching the class and it, it meets for the first time in late January. And I say, look, there's this virus in, in China. You know, we're gonna follow it as a crisis management. How is China dealing with it? We didn't really know then. By February, of course, you know, I'm getting more panicked. I'm trying to get CNN who I've had a long-term contract with like more engaged with this as a security issue. They viewed it as a, as an international issue. Um, and the Atlantic came to me and said, you know, we've noticed that you've been tweeting and I do columns for them. And will you start writing for us on what's about to happen? So on March 4th, I had my first of, of a couple dozen columns for the Atlantic on COVID of which um, it was titled America, you have no idea what's about to happen uh, because we had not dealt with this as a normal crisis. Um, so let me tell you what the bad news is, is that COVID is new. What's the good news? It's that it's actually following normal crisis management uh, uh, pl uh, planning, and we are starting to get towards response and recovery. So we've, I mean, things are, we have, we have lots of complaints about how Massachusetts is dealing with vaccines, but I thought it'd be helpful to maybe take a look back so we can take a look forward. So looking back in crisis management, we call it left of boom. Right, so what are the things we wish we had done before the bad thing happens? In this case, a slow rolling you know, virus, right? It's not a single moment like a Boston Marathon bombing or a hurricane. So what are the things that we wish we did in terms of protection and prevention, right? What are the things that we had either done long-term, you know, more transparency, better public health systems or shorter term, trying to prepare the American public for what was about to happen? 
Uh, we didn't do those things well here. And lots of ink has been, you know, lots of stuff has been written about that. I don't need to go through it. But we then have this moment, right? It's not a singular moment. San Francisco closes down in early March. Various institutions are closing out. But if there's any night that I think the American public as a whole begins to recognize that things are different. It was the night, the, the two things happened simultaneously on that Saturday night, March, 4, March 14th. The NBA closes down for the season um, and Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson announced that they have it, right? This was that, and then, that, and then, and then everything started to close. Okay, we then get into the response phase. That's all the things that we had been doing through the year, some better than others, some more frustrating than others. We definitely had a president who wasn't committed to aspects of this, but it wasn't just a government response. We personally took account of our, you know, the need to protect each other, wearing the mask, distancing. Institutions also, behaved in ways that tried to protect or minimize the risk, you colleges and universities. Um, and then of course, government, but both, remember you saw states sort of lean into the gap that was left by the federal government. Then now this is, so we're sort of in the, between the response and recovery. We have to keep doing the public health stuff, but we are starting to head towards recovery. We know how to live better with this virus. And the reason why I call it adaptive recovery rather than just recovery. So recovery is, you know, the Boston Marathon bombing happens. You know, recovery begins the next day, essentially. You try to reopen up the streets, you get the city back moving again. Here, it's a very, gonna be a very interesting year. And, and as we're hearing Fauci say, you really do have to extend it through 2021. I think we'll get herd immunity, you know, by the end of summer. I personally, I have travel plans in August. I need. I need to get out of my house because uh, uh, I, I keep myself pretty confined um, here. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to learn to live with the virus while we get herd immunity. That means opening schools, figuring out ways that we open up offices, living in ways in which we can, we can be together but not be breathing on top of each other. Uh, so, um, for example... And, and, and it will look very, it does look very different than March. I know we're all home again, but I mean, remember March, we were, you know, cleaning our food and having people leave marketing outside and stuff. And we know better now. We know about masking. We know about social distancing. Markets are better about keeping us apart or limiting sizes and stuff. Um, and then I want to just talk about resiliency. And I'll, I'll answer questions. I see a whole bunch of questions coming in on the chat or conversations about so, so the vaccine is going to unfold over the course of the year based on allocations, distribution, manufacturing. Uh, uh, unlike six weeks ago when everyone was panicked that the vaccine was just sitting there, the truth is we don't have enough vaccine. Johnson & Johnson, single dose, no cold storage is what we're all depending on and fingers crossed that it's going to work okay. Um, that will be better. Uh, single dose, no cold storage. We can get it out to areas that are hard to get to. Um, and then, um, and then verification, we have to figure out a way in which, you know, if you want to go on an airplane, you can prove that you've had the vaccine. So those are all the attributes of a vaccination program. And then how will life be different? Um, and I think it's worth thinking about how we lived before permanent workplace and workforce changes, women in the workplace. This is predominantly a woman's recession. Um, uh, you know, figuring out ways in which we can have healthier buildings. Uh, mitigating the continuing risk of pandemics, but I think we will wear masks. I, I, I can't imagine when I start going on planes again, even with herd immunity, that I wouldn't wear a mask. And then, of course, the bigger issues about equity and health access and health care. So this is sort of, you know, and, and then I, if you look at my chart, so this is the chart I use for every crisis in my class, like Hurricane Katrina, we could fill it out, you know, all of them. And what I'm gonna, and what you have to remember is the goal is that we that we've learned from this, so that we have a better handle on how to do better next time, stockpiles, things like that. So um, I often say a crisis hits the nation as it is, not as we would like it to be. And I think that's important. I think it's important to 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 um, that we that we uh, factor that in. That that is uh, 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 that we can do better. Okay, so that's our biggest threat. So, so 2021, extend the runway, um, I, I, various ages. Some of you may have already been in the process. Um, 
uh, and um, and moving forward. Okay, so um, that's our first major homeland security threat. Let me go to the second right now because I think it'd be helpful um, to talk about what's going on with radicalization. So um, uh, let me uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so. Um, Oh God, how do you even describe this? This is a mess. Uh, so I, I, I came out of the 9-11 world of foreign terrorism and the threat of foreign terrorism. Um, and as ISIS, you know, there was, there was a threat of white supremacy terrorism when oh, President Obama became president, obviously reaction to a black president, uh, but we've never seen anything like this before. 76% of all deaths on U.S. soil by extremism are happening on the white supremacy side. They're not happening from Islamic terrorism or anyone affiliated with anti-Semitism or, I mean, or, or, or Arab or Muslim sentiment. It is um, pure white supremacy, but it's white supremacy with, with other things. Um, the, the, the hate stew that we're seeing is the conspiracy theorists like QAnon, and some of you may have family members or others who are, are, are getting into that ditch, and we can talk about ways to off-road off them or off-ramp them. Um, uh, but it's ultimately fundamentally based in, uh, in depriving uh, minority and progressive communities their right to vote. I mean, fundamentally, that's what January 6 was. And that that's being written out of the narrative is very, very frustrating. And it was ultimately, we didn't like black people voting. I mean, that's essentially it because black people did not vote for Trump. I'm just being you know, honest here. I just got off a, a segment for the NFL and they were all nodding, right? I mean, in other words, they, they know what, what this was about. This was about Atlanta voted. Atlanta voted and, and Pittsburgh voted and you know, places that, that, that president, uh, the former president Trump wasn't getting. So I want to describe what President Trump was doing during the period of his four years, because then you can understand how that changed in December and January. So for many years, people like me and me in particular was using a terminology called stochastic terrorism. And stochastic is just a fancy word for random. It just means a way in which a leader um, uh, incites random but predictable acts of violence. I mean, in other words, it's not like Donald Trump would say, you know, on this date, go do this. He, he started, he did later, but for most of his, he would do things like liberate Michigan. So you and I would say, what does he mean by liberate Michigan? Oh, he's talking about mass, right? But no, his people heard it as a liberation call, right? So they go after the governor, they go after the leadership. Um, uh, and so it's a way of, um, enhancing violence for political gain. Um, and uh, Trump was their North Star. He was their nurturer. Uh, and it wasn't really an issue of both sides, that language that we, you know, good people on both sides, that language that we heard after Charlottesville. It, it, Trump never believed that. He only believed in one side, right? He only believed in a side that was about the, the, the expressions of hate that against his political uh, antagonists. So that's why it was important for people like me and, and the media started to pick it up to call it, to call it a form of terrorism because it wasn't just violence. In some ways, violence seemed too benign. It was really about a kind of violence incited by a political leader to a, for political means. So this is what we encounter for much of his much of his presidency, and you see it. You see it in the arrest. These people followed him, whatever. So it's being nurtured. So after the election, though, that language starts to change, uh, and people like me start to get a little bit more panicked because I mean, because we follow. You know, I follow. What was it? It got more organized and it got more operationalized by President Trump. I am by former President Trump. I am clear to not call him a terrorist, I think, because then, then everyone gets focused on that. But he was the spiritual and operational leader of a terrorist movement, of, and he still is. Um, and so he began to focus, as he was losing more and more court cases, and as his you know, 
efforts became harder to justify, he began to focus on January 6th. And the reason why he focused on January 6th, of course, was because that was when the election, the electors would you know, be, be certified. And he focused on Capitol Hill. So people like me who are following him on Twitter, you know, he's making so much noise on Twitter, it's sort of hard to follow, right? Or he's um, are looking at this and looking at how his followers are hearing him. They're hearing words like fight. And they're hearing words like um, stop the steal. Stop how? Ask yourself when you, when you hear the word stop the steal, stop how, right? In other words, they're not talking about legitimate voting. They're talking about something much more aggressive. So leading up to January 6th, we, you know, we, it had changed from a random to particularized. And so that's why I think, you know, between what he incited that morning to the failure for the Capitol Police to be prepared, to things that were said by various members to, um, uh, and, and, and members of the mob, to his failure or to protect, right? During it, he's, he's tweeting out things against Pence, right? He sort of views everything as like a joke, right? Like, it's like, oh, I'm gonna have Pence killed. And the fact that there's a Confederate flag and a news, you know, all of it is just that this hate. So where does it go? Because you certainly know how bad it is. So as some of you heard yesterday, the Department of Homeland Security announced its sort of focus on um, homeland security threats and the biggest one being domestic terrorism um, because the hate doesn't go away. So what, so, so, but here's how to think about it. The rise of right supremacy and recognizing it wasn't perfect before is, 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 is a three part stew. So the first is what we call displacement theory. Um, which is uh, which uh, sort of started forming in the early 2010s uh, in the white supremacy movement, and it's important to know because in 2016, the same year that President Trump became president, was the uh, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau announced it was also the first year in American history that non-white U.S. babies, U.S. born babies. So I'm not even talking about immigration non-white U.S. citizen babies outnumbered, their births outnumbered uh, white U.S. citizen babies' births. So we are now on that trajectory that we all anticipated at some stage, right, that this, that this melting pot was going to become more melting. Um, and that is viewed by the white supremacists as not only, um, not only a, a challenge, uncomfortable racism, whatever, but that it actually displaces them. And that justifies their violence. In other words, it's not just, oh, I don't like the black couple that moved in next door. It is the black couple's existence means I can't exist. And that's where the violence comes in. So you have that theory. And then you have a theory that is propagated by social media, right? In other words, they find each other. So I don't like the term, there are no, I don't like the term lone wolves. I, these guys aren't lone wolves. They're finding each other, they're egging each other on, they're sharing information, they're you know, talking about planning this, whatever. So you have the, the theory, you have the network, and then what you've had for the last four years, um, uh, um, uh, a leader who has nurtured it. So what's essential and what's very frustrating, if not very depressing about the second impeachment is don't look at it through the lens of a political issue. Look at it through the lens of a counterterrorism issue. And if you do that, which is hard to do and admit to yourself that this is what, where we are as a society, then the total and utter isolation of the terrorist leader becomes necessary because that's what we've done before, right? We've isolated, you know, you have to isolate him. You have to deplatform him, right? That's what we've done. We've de deplatformed terrorist leaders, take them off of social media, don't give them access to money, do not spend money in their hotels. Look at the pictures of Trump Hotel today, they make me so happy. Uh, Deutsche Bank won't do business with them again. No legitimate bank will do business. Um, you know, I don't know, is he gonna get a book deal? What, what legitimate book agency is gonna give him a book deal? Like, he doesn't, you know, I mean, so you, you isolate him. And part of that isolation would include, in my mind, looking at impeachment, not through the lens of, are Republicans up or down or McConnell or is it better to move on, but through the lens of how do you stop a terror movement? And I think that's really important to remember because um, 
because that's, I mean, that's essential at this stage is how do you, how do you stop one? Um, and, and you got to go at the top. It doesn't mean that that stuff all goes away, but it does mean that, um, that it won't be nurtured. And that, that has been something we've been sort of, I think, unwilling to admit, or at least a lot of the media have been unwilling to admit the the inherent racism that began with him coming down an elevator um, and talking about Mexicans. Okay, so those are gonna be the two big issues, I think that are sort of the next six to nine months for COVID, uh, COVID uh, for the Biden administration. Um, and then looking to the years ahead. So obviously John Kerry uh, will be taking over the climate change uh, uh, docket in many ways is, is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and looking at domestic efforts in terms of mitigation. I think an interesting change that you've already seen on the climate change front or in a good way is a focus on, um, on response and disaster management. The Biden uh, White House has already announced a significant number uh, amount of funds for resiliency, which is really important because disasters are no longer random and rare that we have to build better. So instead of just constantly building back as we had, we build stronger for fires and things like that. And then the fourth is, of course, cyber and cyber attacks. So, and, and I can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, I think Russia has now been put in his place. I think Putin has been put in his place. Uh, it doesn't take much. He's not a powerful person. Only Trump made him powerful. Uh, but we will continue to have uh, corporate as well as uh, public sector threats, as we're seeing now. The extent of them is hard to tell. Uh, but it is something that will continue to be monitored at the highest levels as we figure out the, the road ahead. So that's Homeland Security in a nutshell. And I am happy to take questions or turn it back to Julie. I see there's, a, I was trying to look at the dialogue and then I stopped because I was getting distracted. It was so good. Um, but I'm happy to take questions for the rest of this. Thank you so much. I'm take a sip because I've been talking since four. So this is my dinner of champions, Diet Coke and, uh, and m and m so um so julie you take it away while i have a sip okay thank you that was a fascinating if um not always heartening overview of the situation we find ourselves in um i want to remind everyone as we move into the question and answer period to put your questions in the chat um our lwbcc members linda and carlin are going to sort through questions and pass them along to me. Um, but first, uh, Juliet, I'd like to take um, a moment to ask a moderator's question, a yeah. question of my own. Um, and it's one that I get asked a lot as a local league president, and I don't always have good answers to, but as the League of Women Voters, what is the best use of our time and resources yeah to deal with these problems? What contribution can we make? Oh, that's such a great question. And I lost you on Zoom. Just give me one second. There we go. Um, no, I really appreciate that. So obviously um, there's a substantive issue um, about uh, is you know, um, uh, climate change or COVID or uh, um, uh, the, the substantive topics that matter. But I, I think Honestly, I think um, we won, we, I'm sorry, I don't mean that, voting won, right? In other words, you, you, we, we have most number of people voting in a pandemic, we forget that in a pandemic, uh, voting won uh, because everyone was on fire, right? In other words, they knew it mattered. Whatever side you were on, I know you're nonpartisan, whatever side you're on, voting mattered. How do we sustain that? And I mean this as a compliment, a total compliment in a Biden presidency when normalcy will start to feel very familiar. I mean, don't you are, don't a lot of you, like whatever, whoever you voted for, whoever you supported, like it's just, I, you know, I sort of joke, I was just on WGBH yesterday and I said like, I've just been napping every day. I don't even know what it is. Like, I'm just like, you know, like 2.30 comes around, I'll say to my husband, like, I'm gonna close my eyes for a half hour. Like that familiarity of consistency, that we're not all on fire. 
but there was something to the fire that was good. It was exciting. People were engaged. They were talking. We were home because of COVID. You saw the lines in Atlanta and Georgia, you know, that changed the, the, the course of those, of those states in terms of representation. Um, uh, um, how, how, you know, keeping, keeping up the fire, even if there's no smoke, I guess that's, that's my line, keeping up the fire, even if there's no smoke, because I do worry that people will disengage because, because we need it. And I'm being honest with you. I'm a news junkie. I'm on the news. I love the news. I've disengaged. I, I don't watch, I don't watch it at night. After this, I'm going to put on as uh, I smell someone's cooking something, my husband, I love him, but I'm going to put on sweatpants and watch a, like a crappy show on Netflix. Like I'm not, I don't need to watch anymore. So that's what I say. Like, how do you keep that up? That's the most important, despite the subs, you know, and then of course the substantive issues that interest you all. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I, let's turn now to some questions from the audience. Um, Carlin and Linda, do you have something for us? Yes. You sure do. This is Carlin Reed. I have a couple of questions here. Um, okay, a couple of questions around the topic of preparation for pandemics and the January 6th attack on the Capitol building. Yeah. Why were we so unprepared? Yeah. It's a great question. I don't know because even people on the outside, like me, uh, were were saying we're just assuming that the Capitol Police. Um, knew what was going on and knew what was about to happen and they didn't seem to um, uh, react. So there's a lot of stories and rumors. Here's what we do know just based on, on, you know, on, on testimony, that the Capitol Police were well aware uh, that, uh, that the threat environment had increased, that they were well aware they were under threat. And in fact, there's been some testimony of African-American police officers in the Capitol Police sort of running around telling their supervisors like this is going to be bad because they're they're more aware of the hate out there right um, <clears throat> there are stories about the deployment of the military and the national guard and whether that was hindered or delayed for reasons that are inexplicable uh, and i and i think part of it i think you know part of it was uh white privilege of the protesters that uh that you know, if this had been a Black Lives Matter, if, if Black Lives Matter protesters, which they never would do, storm the Capitol, they're not making it in the Capitol, right? I mean, you wouldn't have gotten onto the lawn, right? So, so I do think it's a combination of things that are, are going to be reviewed and analyzed. But we cannot uh, minimize the impact that Donald Trump also had on that. I think a lot of us who were watching his speech that morning, I remember my jaw drop because he was using inciting words. He was talking about, he kept using fight, fight. We're gonna go get what's ours. Like all this language that you just knew a group of his people were hearing in a certain way. And I remember, and I'm not privy to anything special. I remember calling, like literally emailing producers at CNN being like, are you watching this, right? So. So we're going to have to learn about it, but it's inexcusable. The short answer is it's inexcusable. The longer answer is the president of the United States organized and launched a domestic terrorism attack on the Capitol, right? So like, yeah, we weren't ready. We didn't, you know, we didn't learn that in fourth grade civics. Okay. okay. Um, we do we have another question? Oh, yes, we have. Uh quite a few actually. Another topic is disinformation. Yeah. I have several questions here regarding disinformation and I'm going to read off a bunch of the questions and Julia you just decide how you want to approach it okay? Okay. All right. Um, what impact have has changes in the Federal Communications Commission regulations mm. on the number of radio stations that people yeah. can own? What impact has that had on polarization? Yeah. Okay. That's one. What process do we need to do to erase the lies that Trump has professed? That's yeah. number two. I've got two more. Can you handle two more? Yeah. Do you want to stop there? Because I have a short-term sure. memory. Sure. Um, we'll just have, do two. Especially at 734. I have like a really short-term memory. <laughs> okay. So I think what's going to be really interesting is these lies. So you're starting to see the Republicans not only beg to move on, which I think is not acceptable. I think we have to have an accounting of what happened. Uh, but also you're starting to see changes in the polling already 
about support for Biden and it being a legitimate a legitimate election. There's always going to be that 20 percent. Um, I'm sort of disinterested now after four years in moving them. I mean, in other words, they, they've chosen to live that way. I am choosing to live with the 80%. So just remember that. And I want to, because I, I do think it can get very frustrating, like, you know, these things like some percentage of Republicans believe this. Well, sometimes it's what's the question, but the others, how many Republicans are left? How many people still identify as Republicans? I mean, look at your own peer groups. I mean, mine, certainly. I, you know, I, I do a lot in the corporate world. Four years ago, you know, not an insignificant amount of them were Republicans. I can't say I, that's true anymore. Uh, uh, that's Massachusetts, but nonetheless. And so I, I think, um, so here's, I wanna give another poll um, um, on, uh, on two areas on COVID that the, the president tried to do with disinformation. 80% of Americans now believe you should wear a mask. And that's just in a week, right? In other words, he's fighting these culture wars, um, but, most Americans are, are sort of getting it now. So, and, and six Republican governors since he became, since he was elected, have um, moved from no mask policies to masking policies. So, so in some ways, because, you know, Trump always made us choose sides. And I think whatever you felt about who you supported in the primary for Democrats on the call, um, I do think there's something to Biden being right for this moment. Right. I mean, I think that there's something to that, that his uh, capacity to just not engage. Right. Look at his press secretary. She will not engage. Right. Is that, I'm not he's, he's not going to comment about some stupid tweet. And you're like, OK, that's what normal presidents do. The other polling is on vaccine hesitancy. So when Donald Trump was president, it was about 50 50. These were numbers that terrified people like me, absolutely terrified them, me. Um, uh, that changed um, uh, the second Biden became president because a lot of progressives who had been nervous about the vaccine felt better, uh, but also just the way that it was discussed and whatever. So now the vaccine hesitancy is interesting. There's about 15% of the population that we are going to have to pull over the finish line. There's about 40% of people like me who like, you know, would knock off my mother to get in line first if I could. I'm joking, I'm joking. She's getting it next week, but you know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I really want it. So the, the rest is interesting. And this is my, tends to be minority communities. It's not no, it means they are, they are no, they're not no, they're not now. In other words, they're saying, I don't wanna be first. Right, I don't, my community, I don't feel comfortable, a tribal, African-American, whatever. Well, that's workable. That makes me happy, right? Because you can, you can get validators, you can get stakeholders, you can get others who are engaged with it in an important way and, so, and, and can engage those communities. So all of a sudden, what looked like 50-50 is now 85-15. Well, as someone who worries about Homeland Security, 85-15, I can work with, 85% to 15. Now just get me more vaccine, right? That, that's what I'm worried about now. So, um, so those are ways to think about it. On the FCC, I didn't forget the first question. On the FCC, I don't know if I know enough about it, but I do think, actually, I do. I, I think a little bit of the, of the um, opposite, in, which is you know, 60 to 70% of, you know, rather than what's on, I think the FCC has to regulate more on the social media platforms at this stage. I, I used to not be for breaking up Facebook. I am now for it. I think, I think it is a monopoly of information when you just look at the numbers of how people are receiving it and it's not moderating its content well enough. Um, so I'm hoping for more diversification as well as, 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 as you're seeing in terms of, you know, uh, new rules on allowing for more diversification. And I do, I wanna say one other thing about Fox. Um, because those of you who watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox or whatever your choice is, I always, to my students, I always put it in perspective. Um, on a good night, and, and CNN's doing great. There's no question about it. We're doing great right now. On a good night, CNN will have 1.4 million viewers. That's it, on a good night. I don't mean to be, but like, and you know those 1.4 million viewers. That's why you think it has so much influence or you look at Fox, right? On a good night, Fox is in third place now, yay. Um, but Fox will have 1.7 million in a country of 360 million. So part of it is us 
also recognizing people are getting their information from local news, newspapers, Facebook, whatever else. Okay, the other two. Sorry, I'm talking too long. We got to get to more. No, that's fine. All right, um, you answered one of them. One of them was about Fox. Okay, so you good. got you knocked that one off. The third one. Uh, this this one's a, a kind of a broader question. What? Uh, how can we combat disinformation? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple ways. I do think that there is a role for legislation um, and um, uh, and content control. So you're seeing that with some of the stuff against Fox and 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 just pure lies that are being instituted. You're seeing it with. Um, What's the name of that voting company that is going after everyone? Um, Dominion. Uh, yeah, Dominion. Um, so I think there's a role for just pure old good fashioned law and law enforcement. Um, I think that uh, that uh, business and business pressure and monetary pressure on uh, on oh, on media empires that do promote disinformation is key. Uh, and so I do like. I, I'm all for you know pressure, putting pressure on subscribers and and others that advertise that support this crap. I do. I like the movement uh, by uh, businesses to not <coughs> support anyone who voted for um, uh, uh, for not certifying the votes. Uh, I love that stuff. I mean, and, you know, this is this is what's going to move people. So that's a second area that I would uh, you know in terms of disinformation, I wouldn't negate that this is also a national security issue or, or minimize the fact it is a national security issue. So I think that that's relevant in terms of um, um, uh, uh, monitoring um, and, uh, and uh, uh, minimizing the impact of, of that disinformation. And then the fourth, I mean, you, you know, uh, Julie asked me about what I can do. I mean, fourth of it is, is also just discriminating consumerism. And how do we build that at a young age? And you know, I'm going to cry foul for myself. Uh, you know, there are, there were moments during the Trump campaign, or not during the Trump presidency, when when I only sought information that validated the fact that I really did not like this man. And and um, and I think people had started to look to me as a you know they knew my politics, but as sort of a valid you know person, right? A person who, uh, you know, didn't, didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't go down the trap of conspiracy, but I found myself, you know, retweeting or repeating things that were not actually valid. So all of us being our own check and then trying to, you know, through civic engagement, um, uh, be a check on others. So when you talk about projects for the future, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are looking at uh, uh, civics and, and d discerning media um, um, uh, consumption. Uh, a number of media organizations have uh, uh, information on how to discern consumption. And then just accept that 20% of the American public is going to consume what they, you know, there's, there's no point in fighting about it. I mean, in other words, we're, I'm sort of done. I'd rather nurture that more movable 80%. But we have a tendency to focus on the 20, I know. Okay, Carlin, how about another question or Linda? Sure, new topic. Yeah. Um, this is about um, attacks. How concerned are you about the likelihood of domestic attacks in the US and how do we protect folks who yeah. have been targeted by extremists? Yeah. So um, I do think the likelihood is greater uh, than normal right now, because I think with Trump isolated, uh, so you should know that a lot of two things have happened on the websites. One is a lot of the organizations have turned against Trump because he had promised them that he was going to fight till the end. Instead, he just flies off as he often does to Mar-a-Lago, right? So, and, and they're getting arrested. So there's a, a sort of back, backlash is the wrong word, but so there's, an, there's a sense of abandonment by the QAnon and others. Um, the others, but I do think that some of that is going to materialize, and we've seen a couple incidents. Um, uh, so I do think for the first six months it will be bad. Um, on the other side is um, um, is protecting VIPs. I think that that's absolutely necessary. I think uh, 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 congressional leadership, uh, the the squad, all of those that you know a direct hit on them would be meaningful. Uh, need to be protected. It's just, it's just the nature. This is, this is the, this is what Trump has left us in many ways. It's just this sort of radicalized politics. 
I will say, I want to, I always like being optimistic too. I think it goes away relatively quickly. I mean, not relatively, but I think we are going to feel very different at the end of 2021 in terms of the toxicity and the violence. Uh, and part of that, I think, is there's going to be a lot of arrests. Okay, how about another one, Carlin? Sure, here's another one. How about this? Okay, that's, we're going to switch over to COVID now. Okay. Questions are, I'll give you two. I like doing them in Paris now. Oh, and by the way, I have listened to you on CNN and you're really good. I just oh, had to put my you. own personal plug. Okay, <laughs> um, what can Massachusetts do to move more vaccinations along? Oh my God. And what's going on? Why can't we get vaccinated now? So, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I like Charlie. I, I, I actually should say to full disclosure, I, I, I do work with the Department of Education and they're thinking about schools. Um, we shouldn't be in last place at this stage. I mean, you know, I, and I'm, for those of you who do follow me or listen to me, I'm pretty sympathetic to difficulties with large logistical challenges. I am, I, I get it, mm -hmm. but, um, I don't understand what is going on and whether, and you know, you can only blame, it's not like the states didn't know that Trump didn't have a plan. They knew that he didn't have a plan. So, so what is going on here? And, um, and I, I wish I could answer that better because I've been, you know, the first couple days, the first couple of weeks, I was like, oh, okay, we're just getting, but uh, you know, everything I hear is that the challenges are persistent even now. Uh, so he's got to get that. He's got to get that in order. Maybe have an operational head. Um, I don't know what he should, what he can do, but he's got to get it out. Honestly, he's got to get it out of the public health space because we know what to do, and put it with you know emergency management or national guard or whoever. Just get people. Just get things moving. Okay, um, Carlin. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay, I'm going to defer to Linda. Linda, if you, there's one that you want to tackle, you're yeah, welcome to, uh, if you need a moment. You. So go ahead, Linda. Just pick one. There's about 30 there. I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take one near the, near, near the end, some of the more recent ones. Yeah, I haven't I tackled them, it. okay? Um, it's, in fact, somebody wants to know, what do you think about how, do you support having teachers vaccinated before returning to in-person schooling? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm definitely been gung ho on on opening schools. Just looking at the data, um, I mean, I wish we had done it better. So my my overall sense is this, and this gets to gender aspects of COVID. Um, my overall issue is uh, we didn't treat schools as a critical infrastructure. We didn't treat teach uh, treat teachers as a, essential as essential to our economy, and the proof is in the pudding, right? We would never allow a water system to close down with no plan about how to open it up. And as I said, we know more now. We know how we, we can do hybrid learning. We can do all sorts of learning. So I'm, especially after March, when some of the data came out from Europe and stuff, I'm definitely much more gung-ho about opening the schools than I had been. My kids are all home, but I do think their high school is going to open up. One of their high schools is going to open up in March. Um, so I also am a, a promoting teachers going to the front of the line. Um, they should be in group two after the, the um, uh, uh, healthcare workers and, and those in senior care facilities or, or long-term healthcare facilities. And, um, and they are in Massachusetts. So uh, we get them vaccinated, but we don't have to wait for all of them to be vaccinated because we know what works. It's, you, can, you can have ventilation, you can have hybrid learning, you can have uh, six feet away, you can have truncated, uh, you know, days on, days off, but we've got to get these kids. I'm sorry, we've got to get these kids back in school. It's not just the frustration of a mother who has all her kids home. I mean, we have every, I mean, honestly, we have like every luxury in the world um, and we're kind of dying. Like we're, I mean, and they're kind of dying. I mean, they have no, very little interactions and, um, and um, they want to. Uh, and so um, I think, you know, we have to address some of the concerns of the teachers uh, uh, have, you know, waivers and stuff, but, uh, for those that don't want to return or figure out how to use technology, we got to get these kids together, uh, cause they are losing so much. And so, and there's ways to do that. I should just say, 
we know how to onboard kids now. Enough school districts have done it. You do it by cohort. So you focus on the kids that are sort of falling behind big time. And we can monitor that. 15% of kids are not even going online anymore. I mean, we know who they are. Then you bring in, you know, kids who, who have special learnings, whatever. And then you bring in, you know, your ninth graders who might need the acclimation or for high school or your 12th graders who want, might want to be together. Uh, this can be done. So I'm very gung-ho about the Biden uh, focus on opening schools. It's just we, the, the harm to our kids now is far greater, knowable, far greater than the potential risk to teachers, especially if you start to get them vaccinated. Okay, maybe one last question, Linda or Carlin, but Linda, why don't you give us one more? Sure. I'll go back. There are several of them that have asked if Trump is not yeah. convicted and a slash impeached uh, in the Senate, yeah. how, do, how, how it, will he be isolated? You know, yeah. What will be the impact of that? So I think it's going to be re less relevant to the, um, to the institutional, financial, and legal isolation that he will face. This is a man in big trouble legally, even outside of the impeachment. So just view the impeachment as a political statement, but there's other statements being made, media, contracts, all that stuff, right? And, and, and that isolation is ongoing. Look at, I mean, one of the most, the greatest moments of many great moments for a Democrat last Wednesday was Bush, Clinton, and Obama standing there. And it wasn't that we can erase Trump, but it was a statement that we don't have to afford him the luxuries of being a former president, right? In other words, we don't have to play that game because he's a danger. And I like that, I like that isolation. So that's the first. I think though, I think the more interesting question for Republicans is what happens to the party um, uh, if you don't convict. And I don't see how the party sustains itself as a, as a economically conservative, you know, economically, you know, uh, free market, socially conservative party if it has not expelled the radical, let's just be honest here, racist element in its midst. Right? It just, it just, it can't survive um, as a legitimate party. Uh, and so does it split off? Do Republicans all become Democrats? I don't, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm afraid we're going to end here. Oh, well, thank you so much. We're coming up on the end of our time with Juliet Kayyem. I want to thank you, Juliet. You have been a wonderful speaker for us this evening. And I thank you for sharing your analysis about uh, this subject that you clearly know so very well. Um, I would also like to thank our events committee, which is chaired by Stefan Bader for putting the evening together and our intrepid tech support volunteers for keeping everything running smoothly. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time from your evening to be part of this discussion. We clearly have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah. If you would like more information about the League of Women Voters of Concord Carlisle, you can visit our website at lwvcc.org. We have lots of things going on. And if you'd like more information on Ms. Kayam's work, you can visit her website, which is julietkayam.com. And we hope to see you at future League of Women Voters events. Thank, Thank you, you all. and good night. Good night, everyone. Have a good one. Be safe.